time with Herman and Sharon. I love Hello. you. There we are right we're there. We're in the garden today. In the you garden. never know where we're going to okay, be. Okay, let's, let's <laughs> follow me because I want to show our audience Edmund Washington right oh. there. Can you see my picture there? There, yeah, not that picture. That picture is really old. <laughs> <laughs> oh, isn't, isn't that, that pretty? beautiful? Yeah. Isn't that? I just love Washington State. That's that's Puget Sound. Uh huh. Right there, and I cannot imagine. I don't know why you don't buy that house for me. I'd love that. You know, it, it was on the realtor. I saw the realtor. <laughs> no, really, it, it was uh, it was being listed for eight hundred and eighty thousand well not bad for where it's located I, well I, I mean it looks pretty exclusive doesn't yeah it? yeah so who do we, we have today we have we have one of the i have about 10 of my favorites mm -hmm. and i've interviewed as you well know about three thousand and forty years and only 10 out of those <laughs> and well, we're not going to say good. anything about who and, they are and this this guy is one of the 10 I mean it's just <laughs> it, it's he made it <laughs> it's amazing your sister out in Colorado yes this is her favorite Carolyn, yes she loves <laughs> she, she, she always wants the uh, DVDs she, so. she suggested one time can't you having on more <laughs> so, I know so we are aren't we uh, we are but his latest book is miracles in American history Susie Federer Yes, I think he's related to her. <laughs> yes, yes. But we're going to have so, Mr. Brilliant join us today. <laughs> William Federer, right? Come on here. in. Good to have you. Oh, great to be with How you. Are you? Oh, have a seat. good to have Sharon. you. Good too. Oh, have a seat right now. there. Make yourself comfortable. <laughs> That's right. Because we are blessed to have you. Really, we are. Here's a here's a Kleenex in case I get you crying. <laughs> never happened, but you never know. <laughs> Uh, we've got to have your whole family on sometime. Yeah. Remember we had them in, uh, in, in Nashville at NRB one time? Right, my daughter, mm -hmm. yes. Oh, yeah. What are they doing now? Um, well, uh, one's in New York doing uh, private equity uh, biotech startups. Oh, my goodness. Uh, another's in Seoul, Korea. Another's in Washington State, and she writes music. And then uh, one in St. Louis that's uh, managing a YMCA. Isn't it amazing? A guy that is six foot two has the voice of a guy about four foot one. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's got a soft he's, voice. He's a mild man. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And it's, now you've been out pheasant hunting. Uh, we were, yes. And uh, in, in Oregon? No, uh, South Dakota. South Dakota. South okay. Dakota. So it's one of those unique experiences where um, uh, a gentleman that supported me when I, when I ran for Congress. Mm -hmm. And we struck up a friendship, and so it's uh, always a real thrill to be oh. out there. So, and, and, and it was some important people, by the way, too. You were with, which is great. You know, who were you with? Can, oh, you can't say probably, right? Well, it uh, just okay. business don't don't worry people about that. <laughs> I, I shouldn't have asked that, but he's hobnobs <laughs> with well-known people. I mean, tell it's Should amazing. I introduce who William yes, is? Yes, do that. Okay. Hey, Dave, get a close-up of this handsome guy, would you? <laughs> yeah. William J. Federer. We've had him before, but maybe it's the first time for you this yeah, watching. Yeah, it is. You wouldn't be surprised how many people That's just right. tune in. Best-selling author and nationally known speaker and president of AmeriSearch Incorporated. He was also a former U.S. Con congressional candidate. Um, he has a ra uh, daily radio feature, American Minute popular television program, Faith in History, which broadcasts yeah. nationally. And smart man, it's written how many books? Uh, it's over 20. Over Jeez. 20 books, so we are fortunate to have him with us today. Uh, I, I'm, I'm just gonna go through, I, I, what is unique about uh, William Federer? He <coughs> writes books, and, and even though the guests that I have on, I read their books, because my fear always is a guy that authors a book. Sometimes they have written them like two years ago or whatever, and, and, and by the time it hits the market, many of the guests I have on, because I read the book, I start throwing questions at them, and just the appearance of their face is like, whoa, uh, that chapter, you just, you know, that's what they want to say. I, I, let me think about that chapter. So, but this guy, like I say, he's one of 10 that are just unique. Whatever I throw at him, it's kind of like my son-in-law, David, David Anderson, Anderson yeah. Dr. David. Uh, there's, very, there's a few people that are that way where they're 
God has gifted them with a mind that is just to die for. <laughs> and he's he's one, and uh, but when he writes books, and I throw uh, the points at him or the chapters at him or whatever I'm, I'm throwing at him, he just picks up and goes. I mean, it's just unique. Yeah, this is, it's volume two, right? Correct. So the first volume deals with the different battles throughout the Revolution, mm -hmm. the War of 1812, Civil War, Barbary Pirate War where there's a crisis, they pray, and then some miracle occurs. A fog comes in, allowing Washington to escape. Rivers rise to block the British from chasing them. Uh, things like that. This one traces the revivals in American history. And it's wow. really fascinating. As a matter of fact, I'm so excited about it because I've always wanted to, to compile all these. Now, whose name is on there? Well, my wife, Susie Federer. Yeah. And so she's the one who has the idea for it, and we work together on it. And it's really a dynamic book. Oh, it, it sounds like I'm it. I'm telling you, Sharon, I'll, so te I'll bring one home to you. I mean, okay. it is just wonderful. Yeah, I'd love to. Well, perfect. so where does it start? Where does the whole thing well, we start? Well, we start with Ben, um, uh, William Penn. Uh -huh. And so in, in England, you had to believe what the king did, take the oath of supremacy. If you didn't, you're thrown in jail. Uh, William Penn was thrown in jail. He was in the Tower of London for eight months. And he had become friends with the Quakers, and they believed in the inner light of the Holy Spirit. Yes. And so, uh, long and short of it, uh, his dad was a famous admiral, and he basically is, uh, the, the king is indebted to the dad. The dad dies, and the king, Charles II, decides to give William Penn this huge territory, 45,000 square miles, as his personal property. He, he could have been rich. But instead, William Penn opens the land up for persecuted Christians of Europe. And so you wow. have into Pennsylvania come the Quakers and the Baptists, the Mennonites and the Presbyterians yeah, and yeah. all these different groups for this holy experiment to see if Christians can live together in the same. So uh, that's why they're all, they all end up in Pennsylvania. Right. And so the idea is, isn't this, isn't this, I, yeah. I, just, I mean, reading that whole thing, that's, that's the beginning of the book when you get your copy. I mean, I'm not kidding. You turn pages in this and you just, <laughs> it's, it's, it's jaw dropping. <laughs> Well, and the, the importance is, in England, you had to believe what the king tells you to believe. Right. What was beginning to develop is this, cons this idea that you could decide to have faith. Before over there, it's whatever the king says, okay, I don't want to get in trouble with the king. Yeah, yeah, I believe it. Yeah. And it's more of an outward thing. But when you have the Quakers and the Baptists, and the, the, they, they were talking about, no, it's, it's a personal decision. You have a conscience. Your worship to God is only pleasing to God if it's voluntarily given, sort of like love, right? Anyway, so then we have in America the beginnings of these revivals. And uh, some of them are really fascinating. Oh, they, uh, they're in the book. <laughs> love it, love it, love it. So there is a uh, Count Ludwig von Zinzendorf. <laughs> and he is in Germany next to the Czech Republic, a little area called Moravia. And uh, his dad was uh, a ro you know, up a no nobility, but he mm -hmm. dies and leaves this young guy a lot of land. Uh, and he's wealthy, but his mom was a pietist German. Well, he's now uh, getting around 20 and he's going on his royal tour to all the kingdoms of Europe to be introduced to all the lobbyists, so to speak. And he's in Dusseldorf, Germany, and he goes to a museum and he sees a painting of Christ with the crown of thorns. And he's looking at the person and underneath it says, all this I have done for you, what are you doing for me? And this young man is convicted. He goes back and he opens up his estate for persecuted Christians of Europe to come to try to do the same thing, to see if they can live together. They begin to bicker. He leaves his palace and he goes down and lives with them. And they have a communion service. And then they have the communion service turns into a prayer meeting. They're forgiving each other. It goes on for a day. They're all taking turns taking care of the kids and the farms. Goes on for a week, goes on for a month, goes on for a year, goes on for 10 years, goes on for 100 years. This prayer meeting goes what? on uninterrupted for over 100 years. Uninterrupted? And, yes, they continually keep it going. They, they got always somebody's praying. And, and this little group okay. sends out missionaries to all over, to Egypt, to Suriname, to Georgia, to you know, Iceland. Well, on their boat coming over to Georgia, there is uh, two brothers, uh, the Wesleys. And uh, <laughs> yep. John Wesley is an Anglican from Oxford, and he is going to be the Anglican minister for this brand new colony. And his brother, Charles Wesley, is the secretary to the governor, James Oglethorpe. Mm -hmm. And while they're coming over, 
the ship is in a storm and the water is just dumping and everybody thinks they're, they're screaming and they think they're going to sink, sink. But these Moravian missionaries are just there praising the Lord like nothing's going on. And John Wesley said, they know Jesus a little better than I know Jesus. <laughs> anyway, makes an impression on him. He goes, he tries to be a missionary. It really doesn't work out because he's trying to give him doctrine. Right. And, <laughs> and, uh, and of course, a lot of people settling the colony like to drink their whiskey. And, and he was like trying to be really strict. And so he sort of goes back to England and feels like a total failure. And uh, he gets back and he's met by another Moravian who invites him to a prayer meeting, Alders Gate prayer meeting. And while they're there, they're that one? praying all night long. The Holy Spirit comes down and John and Charles Wesley uh, get it. I mean, they're just they're just uh, uh, in awe of the presence of the Lord. They were, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. I mean, because yeah. from that point on. He says, my heart was strangely warmed, yeah. right? Uh, he goes over to the Moravian place in Germany. It's called Herrenhut or the Lord's Village and so forth. Um, and he's there and he says, this is the first place I've witnessed where the gospel is actually being lived out where everybody's loving one another and you're not doing stuff because you're threats to some king. He doesn't join them, but he goes back and he begins a revival movement within the Anglican denomination called Methodism. And he's preaching across England and getting all these huge crowds together. Well, one of the people that gets turned on is George Whitfield. Remember that name? Oh, yes. And then George Whitfield comes seven times to the American colonies and he's preaching up and down. And because he's a little bit um, the revivalist, the stodgy old, they call them old lights and new lights. The old lights were like really into the, you know, the doctrine, but they were a little dry. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, one missionary named David Brainerd got expelled from uh, Harvard because he said his uh, professor was as spiritual as the doorknob. <laughs> you couldn't <laughs> criticize your professors. He was expelled, right? Wow. Um, so these old lights did not like George Whitfield. So he was not allowed to preach in the church. So he started preaching outside and a crowd would grow. And you, when you see a crowd on the street, what do you do? You, what are they talking about? So you go and then some people see you and it grows. He had crowds of 20,000 people outside. <laughs> outside. People would be hanging in trees and he would be <laughs> preaching the gospel and they would be getting saved. Well, Ben Franklin is a printer. He prints all of George Whitfield's sermons and distributes them up and down the colonies and helps spread this revival. So now people are reading about him, reading about him. Then when he comes, he's got big, big crowds. And so universities are started out of this. And but this revival. Now what, what universities? Well, uh, you Harvard, Harvard and Yale were the first yes. ones. But after that, you had Princeton and Brown and Rutgers and these different ones. Isn't that um, amazing? Isn't that, that amazing? And, and they were basically started as preacher schools yes. to train people to be ministers to the Indians. And then they turned into what they are today. Yeah. But um, so this Great Awakening Revival helped unite the colonies prior to the Revolutionary War. So each co the colonies didn't get along. Each one had their own denomination other than Pennsylvania. So Virginia was Anglican and they would chase out the Quakers and the Puritans and uh, New, New, uh, North Carolina. Uh, they were was, doing the same thing, in other words, then you same had to believe a certain way. Yeah. New York was Dutch Reformed. Delaware, New Jersey were originally Swedish Lutheran. Uh, Maryland was originally Catholic. Um, you had New Hampshire was Congregationalist. And, and they didn't get along and they tar and feather each other. But then <laughs> when this Great Awakening. Actually, is that true? Or was yeah. that just an expression? <clears throat> yeah, and they would, um, I was up in Maine and they said, oh, this one it was a Catholic priest was run out of town on a rail and tarred and feathered. And I said, what's that? Well, they, they take, they put hot tar on you and throw feathers on you so they stick. And then they take a, a rail, a piece of, you know, wood, and they put it between your legs and lift you up off the ground. And two guys are holding your legs so you can't really go. <laughs> and they march you around town and then they throw you out. So you're run out of town yeah, on a rail. Because of his religion. Yeah, yeah. So they didn't get along, Sad. these different colonies. But when the revolution started, um, because of this Great Awakening revival, the colonies began to soften up and begin to see that maybe it's not so much that we belong to a particular denomination, but that we all worship Jesus. And George Whitfield would say things like, uh, there's not a Baptist, a Methodist or a Presbyterian in heaven. And everybody's like, what? And then he says that upon entering those gates, we do not lay aside those badges of schism and join together in worshiping our Savior Jesus. And everybody's like, okay, I get it, you know. Um, 
So, so this is this uh, this is called the First Great Awakening Revival, and it's just fascinating. It's one of the stories that's in the book. Yeah. And um, wow, that's great. And, and if you could cover this one, Amazing. Black Harry. Do you know that story? Right. So what happened? Say, I mean, how does a guy? Because <laughs> now I, he's going to come back. You'll see him. Are we going to do these in, in sequence, Linda? Okay. So he's going to come back. And I'm going to, this is going to be the first 20, we're not covering all 20 chapters, but the first 20. And then when he comes back, we're going to go at 21 through 40. So, but, but I mean, this book, when you get your copy, I promise you, first of all, you, might, you might give it to somebody and say, when you read it, make sure you give it back to me, okay? <laughs> because it's that, it's that. You know what? Kind of book. You know what uh, people need this for is for our our teenagers. Yes. That needs to be taught in school. Exactly. Yeah. That know nothing about yeah. or very little about American mm -hmm. history and the revivals. It's great. Okay, Black Harry. So in America, the different states, you had to be an Anglican. Well, when we broke from Britain, you had a situation where these Anglicans had always thought of the king as the head of the church, and now that we broke away, we're not acknowledging the king. And so a whole lot of Anglican ministers go back to England. But one of them stays, and he's a Methodist, which was a revival movement inside of the Anglican Church. He's a circuit-riding preacher named Francis Asbury. And when the revolution's going on, he's going from Canada down to Mexico. He's preaching that the Methodist denomination grows from a couple hundred to like 300,000. I mean, it's huge. And, but he uh, ordains uh, the first black minister, uh, Richard Allen, who starts the AME, African Methodist Episcopal Church. Oh, okay, uh, yeah. He, he uh, has, you know, the first woman uh, teacher for like a Sunday school class, uh, but another one, when he's traveling in the South, he brings along with him uh, Harry Hoosier. Now, Harry Hoosier was illiterate, but he would listen to Francis Asbury's sermons. Francis Asbury would read the Bible yeah. and as they're traveling, and he would, you know, on horseback, and he would memorize entire chat. So this Harry Hoosier was brilliant, so he would stand up and verbatim tell wow. these sermons, recite the scripture verses, and he was considered one of the best preachers in America. And, um, and, and couldn't read. No, and he couldn't read. And so, uh, <laughs> and, and so he was there at the, the Christmas meeting in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, where they decide to break the uh, Methodist revival movement out of the Anglican Church and create its own denomination, mm -hmm. right? And so, uh, and so, but Harry Hoosier, so many people would come to his revivals that it was sort of the stodgy people would call them by the name you know instead of it being oh those are lutherans or those are whatever they would call them hoosiers wow <laughs> because really? they would come to the harry hoosier revival and it sort of got the connotation of you know maybe a uh, an uneducated person yes. from a poor background oh. but it's one of those derogatory terms that turned into a positive term because it's now somebody that is that accomplished so much for the Lord with the humble beginning. Let, let's but a whole in. lot of those immigrants moved west from Ohio into Indiana, and that's where you get the Indiana Hoosiers. I, I mean, he just is it. that where that came yeah, from? It just amazes me. I, I, <laughs> I could just I could sit at this guy's feet all day long and just go, okay, give me one more. <laughs> but let, let's move the to Indiana amazing, Hoosiers. I got I yeah, gotta look that again. Amazing it Grace, head. Newton, and Wilberforce. Well, one of the forgotten chapters is the role of black ministers. So Harry Hoosier was a black man. Um, when the revolution was going on, you had a black man named George Lyle, and he leaves from the Carolinas, goes to Jamaica, and he gets uh, 8,000 people saved. He's considered the first missionary sent out from America was a black man, right, here, um, George Lyle. And, uh, and so this revival is spreading. And, um, but in, in England, you begin to have a missionary movement. I mean, a, a, a abolitionist movement. And there is a guy named John Newton. He mm -hmm. is a rebellious kid. Uh, he is on the street and he's pulled, they uh, would have these press gangs. You say, what's a press gang? You'd be a kid on the street and a bunch of bullies would come up and grab you and take you onto a ship and sail away. And they would make you be a sailor. And of course you couldn't get off the ship and swim a hundred miles to shore, so you're sort of stuck. And so he was pressed into being on a British naval ship. But he was such an honorary, rebellious kid. He'd get whipped, he'd get in trouble, uh, got traded to another ship, another ship. Finally, somebody had enough of him, and they traded him to a slave ship. And the slave ship actually went to, it was taking slaves from Africa and bringing them to the New World. They, 
the first centuries they were buying the slaves from the Muslim slave markets um, and bringing them. But then when he's there, he was so bad, the slave ship actually traded him <laughs> and he became a slave to the black slave owners that were taking the, the other blacks and enslaving them. <laughs> and so he himself had been a slave. Of, uh, and, uh, but he was, uh, finally got out of that. Uh, and um, somebody had given him a book, uh, Thomas Kempis, uh, Imitation of Christ. And it's a religious book and he reads it and it begins to convict him. And they were in a storm and he was, thought he was gonna sink. And he said, I said the first prayer that he ever prayed in his whole life. Um, long and short of it, he, he ends up getting out of it, wants to become an Anglican minister. Uh, he has a faithful wife that stuck with him through all this. Wow. And he ends up meeting, uh, the, the, the Anglicans have all these rules that you have to you know, pass all those tests and go to seminary before you can become a minister. Well, he, he does all that. And finally they, can, they went ahead and let him be a minister, some little country church in, in Olney. Uh, and while he's there, he meets a, another famous uh, uh, Englishman and they write the Olney hymns. And one of those hymns is Amazing Grace. Wow. Uh, how sweet the sound uh, that saved a wretch like me at once mm -hmm. was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now can see. And, um, and so it becomes sort of an anthem. And so he befriends William Wilberforce, who was a guy in yeah. Parliament. Mm -hmm. And William Wilberforce ends up- He was up, a high up politician. Yeah, he was a member of the, the British yeah. Parliament. Yeah. And, uh, and so William Wilberforce gets saved and he's thinking, okay, I wanna be a minister. And John Newton says, you can serve God in other ways and you can serve him in the position that you're at. And why don't you use your position to get rid of slavery? Wow. And so here, William Wilberforce keeps bringing up in the British Parliament, we got to get rid of slavery. We got to get rid of slavery. Mm -hmm. First, it was to get rid of the slave trade. Yeah. And it was like decades of work because a whole lot of people were making money. There's two threads I trace through history, greed and the gospel. And you always have people motivated by the gospel. And they're the ones that love people and have orphanages, medical clinics and dig wells and villages and take care of the little children. And you always have people motivated by greed. And they're the ones that sell people into slavery and take land from Indians and, and They're so the forth. ones that moved to Washington, D.C. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and so it's Herman. a software problem, not a hardware problem. <laughs> we want to say, well, it's this race is bad and this race is good. No, it doesn't matter the skin color. It's what software program are they running on their, on their brain? Well, that's good. Exactly are they Christians right. where they're loving people or are they selfish, greedy people wanting to abuse so people? Good. Yeah. And so anyway, so, so William Wilberforce uh, finally uh, uses his brilliance as a parliamentarian, introduces some bill that uh, when some of the other people are not there and, the, and it, it barely passes, but it outlaws the slave trade. And then after that, um, uh, they push through to outlaw slavery and free the existing slaves. And they did this before America did. And so it had an influence on America. But that's sort of where we get into the second great awakening, if I can yes, share a yes, story yes, on that. Yes, we have five minutes. So you had the first great awakening with George Whitfield. After the revolution, you had a preacher named James McCready in Kentucky, got a little church, gets the men of his church to fast and pray one Saturday a month for revival. Had a meeting, 500 people show up. Next year, 1,500. Next year, 8,000. Next year, 15. The next year, 25,000 people meet in the Kentucky woods. And they have, they have to camp out, so it's called camp meeting. And they um, don't have microphones, and so they build a platform and another 30 yards, another platform, another 30 yards, and they're all preaching at the same time. You get out of the earshot of one preacher, you get into the earshot of the other. Um, uh, Abraham Lincoln's parents had went to one of these revivals and got saved, and um, his mom was really a strong Christian. And so this spreads, and then on the coast, in the colleges, there was this French infidelity coming over. So the, we had the, there was a French Revolution and a whole lot of this, you know, immorality stuff. It was filtering under the campuses. We've experienced today a lot of, you yeah, know, socialist yeah. type thought and yeah. filtering into campuses. Well, back then it was French infidelity, and so at Yale you had almost the whole student body, which at that time was like, you know, thirty or forty kids, um, in in a class. Uh, but the president was Timothy Dwight, grandson of Jonathan Edwards. Wow. And Timothy Dwight sits down with the kids at lunchtime and rather than staying up in his president's office. 
and he lets them tell all of their French infidelity stuff, and he listens, and he says, okay, I listen to you, now you got to listen to me. And he goes point by point by point and refutes them and shows the gospel, and it starts this revival. So that the whole student body of Yale gets on fire for Jesus. Uh, they call the place a little chapel for the Lord. Of course, they're teaching Hebrew and they're teaching the Bible, and so out of that uh, begins to spread another missionary movement, and uh, it's the, the Haystack Prayer Meeting Revival. And um, do I have a time for that? Sure. You have three minutes. Good. So some students are coming back from class uh, up in a, in a New England college town, and they're walking across a field, and it starts dumping rain, and they hide under a haystack. And while they're there, they begin to pray and pray for world missions and commit their lives to world missions. And they, then suddenly the rain stops. They go back to class and tell the other kids what they just prayed and what they just committed themselves to, and it starts this revival movement of missionaries. And so we're sending missionaries to Burma. Adoniram Judson in 1812 goes over there. We're sending missionaries to Hawaii. And I got a whole chapter on that. Yes. Uh, they send missionaries to the Caribbean. And th this begins to spread. So in the next couple decades, literally thousands of missionaries go out and it changes the entire world. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a real uh, fascinating chapter. That, um, but it all started with this Haystack Prayer Meeting Revival. And, uh, and then the ones that went to Hawaii, uh, there was a... Um, a kid whose dad was a you know pagan priest and he didn't want to you know cut open chickens and stuff so he <laughs> so American whaling ships are coming over there and he and another friend uh, Henry Opukonawa I always have trouble pronouncing Hawaiian names and Thomas Hopu they hop on this ship little stowaways and the ship is a whaling ship and it lands in, in C Connecticut and where Yale is and they get off and they end up getting saved and one of them actually joins the the, the, the military and helps Andrew Jackson fight in the War of 1812. And, but the other one writes his life story down and it gets printed, becomes a bestseller, uh, and he dies. And then uh, his, the other one, Thomas Hope, the one that was helping Andrew Jackson in the, in the Gulf of Mexico yeah. in the War of 1812, he comes back and he gets convicted and he decides he, he wants to lead these missionaries and be an interpreter. And so you have Hiram Bingham wow. and, a, and a bunch of others come over to Hawaii. The, the second ship to Hawaii was a black, had a black missionary named Betsy Stockton. Hmm. So if people think here's, here's a, a black woman missionary right. in the you know, 1820s going over to Hawaii, and she's teaching school, and she's starting schools, and she's teaching the Bible. Well, this starts a, a Hawaiian Great Awakening revival. Wow. And uh, the high priestess goes into a volcano and defies their god Pele. And it's, it's just fascinating, but it's all in, the, all in this book. <laughs> okay. You got to get a copy of it. If you didn't get enough today, <laughs> it's going to be back tomorrow. Okay, yep. and we're going to then we're going to go into additional chapters. Uh, uh, George Williams, who started the YMCA, uh, shoe salesman, an evangelist called Dwight L. Moody. We're going to go into uh, Helen Keller, all of that. So if you didn't get enough today, which I couldn't have, <laughs> <laughs> and you have an opportunity, yeah. by the way, to get your own copy, you will absolutely love it, not put it down, pick it up again. God bless. Bye-bye.